bro, I have the address of the descendants of the white people that own my family. I could Zillow their house. So I gotta go down there and fucking just, just see. Give him a bill. Yeah, document it. Uh, yeah, just, <laughs> that's funny. Your special is too good. Your special is so good that it makes me reevaluate other specials I've watched <laughs> recently. <laughs> Thank I'm not you, kidding. Sir. My wife Jenny and I were just watching it. We're just like, oh no no no, because we watch all the specials. Mm -hmm. We're like, no no, this is this I'm is a, this happy, a cut above. I'm just happy Comedy Central finally put it out for free on YouTube where people <sighs> could actually see it. <laughs> 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 yeah, but thank you, man. Thank you, man. No, it that means the special is unbelievable. It was fun. It was fun to put together. It's fun to kind of tightrope walk, and then there is the sunrise the day after the special. Yeah. Where it's like, fuck. Yeah, I got to write another hour. <sighs> I'm living in that right now. I'm on tour with my new hour. I'm like, oh yeah, you gotta have a keep up to the old hour. I have. I have the working shards of something but it's not necessarily all the material that I'm in love with. Like I had, like if you paid money to come see me, yeah, you will get a different hour from anything that is currently available digitally. Yeah. So you will get new material. Now, is that what I want to really be digging into? That's exactly what my tour is right now. It's just the funniest just, things I can think of. And yeah. that's what I have. Yeah. And then as things progress, I'm going, oh, that joke isn't about that. Yeah. That joke is about, that, like there's a bit that I've started working slowly. I got invited to, I don't want to say a sex party. <laughs> I like the intro. Cause it's, it's, it's seven days. So okay, a party is one day. Okay. It's like opinion. a retreat, like a sex retreat. But not cult, but it is groups of couples fucking. So All you're day. you're with your partner at this? That's the, how it's proposed to me. I'm not dating nobody. That which is part of the bit. It's just, okay. You, it's not a date. That, like this is a long term relationship activity. Okay. So you got invited to this to go to to go to a sucking fuck on an <laughs> island somewhere where other couples are sucking and fucking, and together you're all in a house, not sucking and fucking each other, just. Hey, we're going to talk about intimacy and like there's deeper themes to why the people are being brought together. So right. Yeah. It's a it's a run at, at its inception. That bit was just a run of sex jokes, and right? Sexual insecurities and performing, maintaining an erection in a group setting, like just easy, in my opinion, easier shit to mine. Right. right? Yeah. But then when you really start gnawing on the bone and getting down to the bone marrow, yeah. It's about how difficult it is to make new friends as yes. adults. 100%. And so that's the bigger thing that I need to unpack. I've always loved your comedy. And I think part of it is the exact thing you're describing right now, which is you're not just telling jokes. You're figuring out what's the joke under the joke. What is this about? You know, in your yeah. special Imperfect Messenger, you do a really funny bit early on about facial like an app that shows what you look like when you're 80 years old why would you need an app like that that's super funny and at the end spoiler alert if people want to put press pause on this yeah. watch imperfect messenger which is on youtube for free right yes. now and come back to this at the end you talk about how there's photos from the civil rights movement where we some of them are still alive yeah and like white people at lynchings <laughs> yeah i need to know what they look like now <laughs> <laughs> so we can go have a conversation. Yeah, yeah. So we can go have a conversation. If only there was an app. <laughs> oh, if only there was an app. And I gotta say, man, I got, I got really. I was laughing, and then I was really emotional at the end of your special, and I so appreciate it. Thank you, man. And you also tie back this thing with your son, where you're face. I think that's your son. Yeah, facetiming yeah, at the beginning and the end, and. And that too, I don't want to give it away. People should watch it themselves. It was very emotional. It's the simplicity of how easy it is to achieve happiness. And the older you get, the more difficult it is to have a sliver of happiness. 
and like that's what the moment that's what the bookend yeah. is supposed to be it's just there's days where my son is perfectly happy for hours with a cardboard box a cardboard box yeah you, you you're facetiming with him at the beginning of the special and he's in a cardboard box and this is something people always say is about kids it's one of the wisest thing you can say about having kids they're as happy with the toy in the box as they are with the act, just the box. Yeah. They're good with the box. Yep. They're more imaginative than we are. Yeah. As to and what could make you happy. He's he's in a space shuttle, and then I pick, I close him up in the box, then I pick up the box and shake it to simulate <laughs> lift off. Like when he was lighter, then I don't have the rotator cuff for that shit now. But yeah, like that, that interests me. You know, we talked a little bit about just unpacking this shit with my pops. But that's its own beast. Like, I, I even tried to, like, tell stories about my dad within the existing hour that I'm touring. Yeah. And it's just too. They just it's it's spaghetti and chocolate cake. They are both delicious, but you cannot put them on the same plate. When, and time. when you say which two things, the thing with your dad and what else? The emotions with my father and then just like any other topics that I'm doing now. That's oh, just world analysis. Oh, we're all alone in the world. And how do you make friends? And isn't making friends weird? And then yeah. how do you break up a friendship when you're older? And it, like that type of stuff. And then also, yeah, I remember the last conversation I had with my dad. <laughs> You know, like I, I talked yeah. about, like we talked about this, I think, off camera once, just about when I did Finding Your Roots. Yeah. And I found out all this extra shit about my dad that I yeah. just didn't know that reconstituted why he may have made certain decisions he made in parenting that I didn't agree with. Yeah. So it forces you to see somebody in a different light. What, do you, can so you, can like, you name an example fuck. of that? Yeah, he... My father lost his father when he was four. Yeah. And then, and this is according to census data, there was no other male head of household ever recorded in any home that he lived. Mm. So there was never a man in the house. Might have been men, he might have men in his life, but there's not a man in the house on a regular basis. That's drastically different. That's yeah. a drastically different upbringing. There's, there's just a lot of things that I learned about him from that show that to me painted a picture of understanding why he may have had a distrust not only of relationships but of just loving people or having any type of long-term investments in people because people go away yeah so why even bother with that like that's just a weird emotion to deal with right you know but so I'm it's also, easier to it's easier to be at a distance yeah, but I'm also the ninth of 11 kids by five women by one account and some other accounts I'm 11 of 13. So if you fucking like that, it ain't for love. <laughs> My God. You're coping. You're, you're, what are you, un like, what were you dealing with, bro? Right. Now, what that is and what that was, I don't know. I got to go do all the digging. I got to talk to people, which is stressful because most of the people that can answer those questions are dead or dying. You know, that's the fucking one person show or, yeah. you know, it's maybe it's a book or something. You know, I don't know. But in the interim, figuring out how to make that funny is going to be a long, long fucking walk, bro. Yeah. And so in the interim, I still, you know, write stuff that's still fun and observational. And I still I'm, I'm convinced we talked about this last time you were on the podcast. I'm still convinced that you should you should do a solo show in New York and sit at an off Broadway theater for a while, yeah. because I feel like your story is so layered, it's so fascinating. You, Neil Brennan, yeah, and Chris Rock. But Chris Rock wasn't as polite. You know, Chris Rock is never polite. Motherfucker, what you doing? Do some <laughs> other shit. <laughs> He okay. is not. He do is that not. daddy shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't beat around the bush. Right. No, I love that about him, obviously. Yeah, so you, I'm you do mining too. it, but yeah. you got to go and mine it and then sit and chisel every rock and figure out what is the show. So I got to go get that. Bro, I have the address of the descendants of the white people that own my family. Unbelievable. I could Zillow their house. I mean, come on. So I gotta go down there and fucking 
just just see give him a bill yeah document it uh, yeah just, that's funny <laughs> request back hey, pay hey you want to go get dinner you're gonna get the uh, check i thought about if i was rich enough i thought about just wherever they work buying that company oh my god <laughs> jesus so christ I own them oh my god like I've thought about that. Have you done that on stage? No, I mean, that's funny but, but as what hell. It, but does that connect to the dad shit, or does that connect to the revenge and <sighs> racism and the trauma it's and the all... generational? And does that segue nicely with self checkout jokes and the suck and fuck jokes? Yes, yes, and yes, and yes, and know. yes. All right, right. We're gonna have this. Is gonna have to be know. a long conversation. I, like it's. <laughs> Because it all relates. It's because all, it's all from you. But That's it's why. All, but like, even if we just go with the white people in Georgia, I feel like there's more to be mined if I actually go down there. The white people whose descendants yeah. owned your and they're also not your, rich. Yeah, which is a whole nother Ancestors. fucking analysis of slavery. It's just how many white people fumbled the bag with slavery like you fucking had people and they used to which is just how vicious corporations are they took slavery from white people like only they made profit like how the fuck are you three and four families deep into owning people and you still couldn't turn generational wealth these motherfuckers they're not doing well bro they're in like a Roy, small georgia town you can't and it's you like, can't slave shame people <laughs> Haven't you heard the new rules? You can't slave shame people. That's massa shaming. <laughs> like, like the fact that, I don't know, it makes me laugh and then I'll have to figure out how to make it funny on stage and make white people feel okay with laughing at it. Please. But like the idea that part of the only reason why Lewis, Dr. Henry Louis Gates and everybody at PBS, part of the reason why they were able to trace my family so far back was because my family was owned by a series of poor white people mm. who could only afford a couple of slaves at a time. Like a lot of enslavement was not the big industrial plantation. A lot of it was just two or three black people working for a small family. So like there's something in there, Yeah. but I gotta do that bit from a place where I'm still respecting the institution of enslavement. Yeah. But also going, ha ha, you broke motherfucker. You could only afford three niggas. Oh you ain't God. shit. Jesus Christ. And it's it's interesting because when you start introducing thoughts like that, a lot of white people get very tight. Like white people yeah. are very scared. Of, they're very conscious of trying to do the right thing, including not laughing at the wrong thing in a live comedy show. Roy, I'm going to do you one better. You're talking to one. <laughs> one of the good ones like <laughs> like there's this wall of empathy with audiences with mainstream art with white people that i feel like i have to work through so like i learned that working with mulaney when mulaney came back out on tour i opened for him a couple times and granted his his crowd is already charged up to give him a hug so they want to hug anyone you know like they're That's kind so funny That's i'm not a, saying that as an insult but no, it's, it's just not like, an insult it's just like he, do you want to may i hug you this, i just appreciate you yeah. and so like on steroids of empathy steroids of empathy yeah and i've never performed for an audience like that before ever like i've never performed for an audience that was so as ready to show concern as they were to show laughter yes yeah i have that too so, i have certain jokes sometimes where i go like oh that's too much for my audience yeah my but, own audience okay and so i'm learning that now with my audience when i go my dad is buried next to another woman and we didn't find out that he bought his and hers burial plots until we were walking the casket up the hill to the graveyard, but also one of the most illustrious and decorated civil rights journalists this country has ever seen. Right. So deal with that the way I did. Right. Like, in other words, he had a mistress. Correct. And also he was a very honorable person in 10 Completely different ways. Completely honorable yeah. and 15 billion. When I did the correspondent to dinner 
after the correspondence dinner, I was getting handshakes from journalists whose first job was working with my father. Wow. There were so many people in that room where working with my father was their first job. So many people, especially black journalists. So he's a civil rights journalist in Alabama, right? All over. Um, over, Well, at the time in Chicago, uh, St. Louis as well. But he would embed himself in Vietnam, South Africa, Zimbabwe, wherever there was war. So when you were at the when you were at the White House Correspondence Center, people people came up to you, journalists, and said they 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 sort of looked up to you. Your father story. Wow. Your father did the story. So you can have empathy, but this is a comedy show, my nigga. I need you to laugh. Yeah. And, but I can't take that away from you. And most people don't want to give it up. Most people want to feel sorry because they want you to know that yeah. you care. And, and with Mulaney's audience, it was the first time I became self-aware of like, okay, if I'm going to start talking about some stuff where I need you to laugh with me because I've already yeah, dealt processed with it. it yeah. How do you bomb squad, red wire, blue wire, the empathy wire yeah. without cutting the humor wire in an audience member's psyche? And what are the jokes that can help clip that wire first? And then I can get into the deep shit and it be funny. Yeah. And it'd be okay for you to laugh because I don't deal well with an audience that puts empathy first. And so that was that's why I opened it for Mulaney those couple of times. That was an important week. Yeah. Because it was like, oh, oh, okay. So if you're going to try and get into some shit, then you've got to make sure that this is worded and this connects oh, to yeah. this and that. And, and now you're talking about acknowledging the thoughts and the feelings, which was a digression I never thought of. Because I've never had to fucking do that. Of course. It's, like, it's never, pretty, honestly, it's pretty new in comedy. Also. I mean, it's pretty like in the last five years kind of energy, I would describe Oh yeah, that. this is all George Floyd, I want to care and concern. I I'm, want to be an, I'm I, cognizant of what is happening. So I want, I want to be, be an sensitive. ally, which you talk yeah, about in your special. All things, not just race, but just across all levels of I care about your plight, whatever your plight is thing. So, okay. I Because the, the thing that I had up until that, that protected me was black laughs. Black laughs. <laughs> If I'm if I'm doing the edgy joke yeah. about race and black people laugh. Yeah. You have black audience members that are the tent poles of the audience. That's the cue for you to that's the blue wire clip. It is. I don't even have to clip the blue wire because you saw the black person laugh. So now you know where I'm coming from because they've already Yeah, I know what you mean, but I actually think you're so good at reasoning through ideas on stage that you can reason through the audience's experience of what you're saying yeah. in a way that doesn't feel hacky. Yeah, I'll, I'll figure it out. You know, I, I feel good about where I am. I mean, there's there's probably still another 30 minutes of just new thoughts that I haven't mined yet. Like, I don't know, I just go to different parts of town to test different shit. Same way, like- I'm the same. Yeah, we talked, did we talk about that last time I was on the pod about how I like when I'm working the hour special, the week before I tape, I go to Peoria and then I go to Atlanta. No, that's smart. Yeah. Well, I try to do it the other way around. I try to get, put it in front of as many black people as possible and then put it in front of as many white people as possible. Yeah. And then tape. Yeah. Like, so, okay, once the jokes are dialed in and chiseled down. Yeah. All right, black people. Have I nailed everything? Is there any, <laughs> are there any holes in this, these theories? Before I take this out to the mainstream, and then, and then you go to Peoria to see how well they can take a punch to the mouth. <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's that, you have that joke in Imperfect Messenger that I love, which is basically like, sometimes there's too many American flags. Oh yeah, how many American flags equals a Confederate yeah. flag? I'm just like, <laughs> I've had thoughts like that in my notebook. You nailed it. You nailed yeah. that joke. The one joke that took me a minute to kind of work out was the the black Brits um, that black British actors who play African Americans mm-hmm. in movies about African Americans mm-hmm. and like that's one that like within the black community that is a serious serious issue and it's touchy and it's like okay. You're an actor, 
And if you can do a regular accent, cool. But also, should that role go to a African American who doesn't have to do an accent? So it's sure. the debate of heritage versus talent. And I did that joke early on, and I got checked by African American. And the basic the basic network note I got from this person <laughs> was it was coming across too much like I was protecting and defending black British actors oh. and saying that they have a right. Yeah. And that's not what I was saying at all in the joke. Yeah. The whole point of the joke was you don't know they're British. <clears throat> right. And then you find out they're British and there's a feeling of betrayal. Yeah. Because you don't know they're British until they do the interviews for the movie. Yeah. So the whole joke is just about discovering that. And it's a long, in hindsight, I probably could have trimmed some fat out of it, but it was just a long walk to talking about how when I found out the day, every black person has the day they found out Idris Elba wasn't from Baltimore. Oh my God, that's so funny. And that's the joke. It's so funny. And then from there, we're right into Leo DiCaprio. Yeah, yeah. And we're right into- Being in Django. Yeah, white people, the most, the bravest actor is white people who say nigga in civil rights movies. And that joke was much wider. Yeah, that joke is amazing. But it only worked in black audiences if I gave props to Leo, because Leo is seen as above the fray of regular white actors. Wait, with so black audiences? With black audiences, only the Leo part got the laugh, so that's why the rest of it got trimmed. Wow. Mainstream audiences would laugh. Like There was a lot of fat, the, the joke in the longer version, in the longer original iteration was that it was other accounts of white people saying nigga in movies with black people in the room. Yeah. And the idea that, man, that's great white actors, man. But I, it was um, Benedict Cumberbatch yeah. in 12 Years a Slave. I was like, yeah, man. And also, you remember 12 Years a Slave? You don't fucking, black people couldn't pick Benedict Cumberbatch out of it. He's a great actor. I saw, but, I saw 12 Years a Slave in the theater. <laughs> Respect, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> Thank you and, for uh, your allyship. Thank you very much. Applause. I'm going to leave some <laughs> room for applause. Um, Paul Dano's character is a racist, and he gets yeah. like, I think he gets knocked down or punched or whatever. The audience cheered. Yes. Like they were at a football yes, game. Yes, that's what made Django great. It because was wild. <laughs> it's a hero it's amazing. slave. Like that, that whole run, it felt too much like, Man, I like it when white people call black people Nick, and that's not what I was trying to say. Oh, interesting. But if it's taken like that, yeah, you have to respect the response. Like, I'm not here to go to battle with the audience. If just mentioning Leo DiCaprio and Django yeah. gets the laugh, then I've made my point. Trim the fat. There's no need for me to have you annoyed with me by the time I get to Leo. Well, we could just do Leo and just say Leo was the best of all of them yeah, because he did it in front of Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah, yeah. That was a bit that needed a lot of refinement over it's, the course of a year in front of this is one of the, this is one of the things that I struggle to explain to people who aren't in the comedy field about stand-up comedy is sometimes people will see somebody live and they'll go, "I don't like how he said this or she said this." And you go like, that's the nature of the live experience of comedy is actually Roy or me or whoever it is, we're actually going too far on purpose to know that that's too far. Yeah. And then, and if you're a comedy fan, in my opinion, you're signing up for that as a concept. Yeah, this is a workshop. I loved that people were so upset when you said that you weren't going to take over the Daily Show. You were trending I don't for know a few why days. People were mad. Like we were upset because you seem like such a logical host for the show. I don't think that. Well, first off, I'm I'm appreciative of all of that. If anything, you just showed me like, oh, okay, well. People were watching. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank God. People were watching. Um, People appreciate what you were doing on the show. If, if anything, that week, 
that that week of everything when it came out that I was leaving the show, it just gave me some validation. Like, okay, well, there's space in this world for more of my ideas. So let me just figure out how to do them. And that's when you, you know? decided to plant the story about Hassan in the New York. <laughs> That's that's literally why everything kind of fell apart. Like, is it? Well, they, from as far as it was told to me, Hassan was the guy. It was gonna be Hassan. I heard that too. Okay, okay, cool. So I'll hang out here the rest of the year, and we'll see what Hassan wants to do and what his vision is, and whether I fit in that. You know, I'm still trying to sell my own sitcoms. I'm trying yeah. to write movies. Like, there's other shit I I want to do, but let's yeah. see what. It's as Ronnie Chang puts it, and I quote, the best job in comedy. Yeah. The Daily Show Great is job. the best job in comedy. I would argue number two is Saturday Night Live. Yeah, the weekend update job. Any job at yeah. 30 Rock, any job on that floor to me. It's hard to say which one is the better job in comedy, but when I say best job in comedy, I'm talking about what you learn while you're there, the people that have graduated from those places, and the level of longevity that you could have within that building if you just do the job. Right? Yeah. More plays into SNL by people come and go. But yeah. If you talk to anybody who's ever worked for Lauren Michaels, it was when I was there, man, it was great and doing this, this, and that. You just learn a lot. So yeah. I wasn't going to just leave Daily Show yeah. just because there's a new host. But then the question becomes what does that host want? Yeah. Then the New Yorker article comes out. Yeah. So New Yorker article comes out, and then the buzz is that there's a shift at Comedy Central in whether or not Hassan's still going to be the guy, which eventually turned into he's not going to be the guy. Right. This is so people know. This is when Hassan, there was a New Yorker article that I think was a bit of a hit piece about the veracity of some of his bits in his yeah. specials. As I as I as I said to him and to a, another another person they flipped over his stand-up comedy and looked at the nutrition facts. <laughs> That's so funny. And tried to decide whether or not it had the right percentage of this or that. Or, yeah. You know. Okay. So it comes out that he's not going to be the guy. So the question was just, you know, well, what's the, what's going to be the process now? Yeah. Like, I'm sure you got to figure out who's going to, who's on your list. Yeah. And they couldn't, in my opinion, they couldn't articulate adequately enough for me what that process would be. Yeah. And whether or not I fit into that yeah. process. I respect that it's a process. It's a tough. Yeah. As we're recording this, they still have not chosen. Yeah. At the top of January, they still have not. We're talking about top of October. That's three months ago. So yeah. what I got an feared, election coming up. What I feared in October was being in a position in January where maybe you do choose a new host yeah, and it's someone that does not want me there or someone I don't want to be there with or it's a format that I don't want to rock with. Yeah, And I feel like after eight years, I've earned the right to take to step away for a minute and just, well, let me just see what else is out there for me. Yeah. If, and if they decide, they, hey, you want to host? I, hey, the door's open. Okay, well, I, you got my number. But... To figure out what's next for me while also being a correspondent, that is insane. That is an insane old endeavor to walk to walk into while also trying to be a father. Yeah. You cannot do all of those things adequately. One of them will suffer. Yeah. So love you guys, but I'm going to step away. I think the reason why you would be such a good host for that show is that the way you speak in Imperfect Messenger is... They're hard jokes, they're, they're edgy jokes, but somehow we feel like we're friends with you. I appreciate it, man. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's not an easy job. It's definitely, I think hosting any late night show, like if I'm, oh yeah, if you're offered an opportunity though, you have to, I have to say yes. I can't say no. Yeah. Like it's, it's, you know, I'm going to stop short. It's not some militaristic obligation or a calling, but if somebody's going to give me 30 minutes on their channel yeah. every night. Yeah. It's yeah. Big, yeah. I'm going to take that and figure out what to do with that and how to build opinions and perspectives. Though the more I look and research, the more I feel like now 
you might be able to just do it alone. Yeah. If you're smart enough about it, because you have to go and they're not rolling the dice on a lot of people. I agree. Um, all right. This is called the slow round. Can you think of a time when you were so scared you ran away? I mean, there's, I've had guns put on me before. A couple oh, wow. of times. Usually cops, which is oddly scarier. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Only because, like, in the streets, there's still rules. Oh, interesting. There's an etiquette. If you asked me to choose between two people pulling a gun on me, I would rather a non-police officer be the person holding the gun. Wow. Just because that person might not get away with it, and they know it. Mm. So maybe they will hesitate. Now, it's important to also say every police officer that's pulled a gun on me didn't shoot me. <laughs> so let's be fair. But um, there was um, there was a there was a dude. This girl stole my class ring. It's a long story, but there was we had, we had a it was in college. We had a stripper over to the house, and and she was going through shit upstairs when she was supposed to be in the bathroom changing god to a friend's party and like we had the we had the biggest apartment of our circle of friends right. at the time and so hey, it will be fun get a stripper and so long story short for a friend's birthday we hire a dancer she dances mm -hmm. she needs a ride back to her neighborhood mm -hmm. i'm the only person at the time at the house with a car i give her a ride back I worked at Golden Corral at the time. At Golden Corral, you couldn't wear jewelry mm -hmm. on the clock because it'll fall on the mashed potatoes. Yeah. So my class ring was in a cup. <laughs> okay. In a cup holder. <laughs> I know it was in a cup holder because that's always where it is. Okay. I drop her off. I come back home and I'm getting ready for bed and I look around my room, I'm like missing a watch. I look at my watch drawer, there's two watches gone. I go, where the fuck is my ring? Oh, it's got to be in the car. I go back to the car. The class ring is gone. I go yeah. back in the house. Where's y'all shit? Everybody check your shit. Motherfucker got us. Motherfucker, she got us. Oh, my God. So everybody's in the room checking their shit. Just all types of shit is missing. And then where'd you drop off? We got to go back and motherfucking find her. I'm going, you got damn right. Oh We're like God. 18, bro. We're oh 18. We got to find her. And like some grown woman ass stripper, like fucking 34. <laughs> it's just going through our home. <laughs> just looking. It just got us. Wow. Well played. Like I'm well not played, even yeah. I'm not even mad about the shit. We was just dumb. Yeah. That's so crazy. we go back to the street where I drop her off and now we're out just fucking walking walking in the middle of the street like fucking Grand Theft Auto. Yep. In the middle of Tallahassee. Fucking French town. So we're doing laps up and down every street in French town. And, and we see a dude and he was the dude that facility he was the middleman of the transaction and so motherfucker where she at motherfucker motherfucker bitch took my class ring like now that I'm older I'll say that and we're like banging on his hood of his car and shit like we're like wow we, we've encircled this man who we've entrusted with hiring a trustworthy dancer yes. for our evenings. Yes. And we believe she's taken some of our belongings. Yeah. And so we're fucking banging on the fucking hood and this motherfucker just takes a long drag of his cigarette. He rolls the window down and he just goes, look here. <laughs> look here. I don't know what y'all came here for, but I'm going to circle the block. And if y'all still here, <laughs> you're going to get what you came here for. Oh, gosh. And I didn't even know what the fuck that meant. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it felt like we should leave. Yeah, we got to leave. We I, should leave. Yeah, yeah. That would, be, that would be my cue. Never pulled a gun, never said anything else, rolled his window up, and cruised slowly up the block. Gave us ample time. Yeah. And we just fucking left. We fucking yeah. left. Like, 
And in hindsight, I cannot think of a single person who still has their high school class ring. That's so funny. You got to put that in the show. Yeah. That goes in the show for sure. You know how stupid you got to be to die over a fucking ring that says you're a Sagittarius and you like baseball. (laughs) Fucking Herf Jones. That shit is the biggest. Class rings are one of the biggest fucking scams. What? What is a song that makes you cry? Uh, or a prototype outcast. Andre 3000. It's an outcast song called yeah, Prototype? Yeah, I hope that you're the one. If not, you're the prototype. Oh. We'll tiptoe to the sun and do things I know you like. Oh. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one that would get you thinking about women you should have treated better. <laughs> it's like, ah, fuck, I fucked that one up too. Ugh. That's powerful. And then I play Bombs Over Baghdad to offset it. <laughs> Andre 3000, man. He, uh, you read that story yeah, recently, right? Fucking bare naked soul, bro. He, he bears his soul in yeah. his lyrics. You know, he left left, uh, left music and now he does like some other type of music. Yeah, he plays flute now. Plays flute, Rele- yeah. Released an album. A whole released an album. album. And then it's been revealed he's been ghost fluting on yeah, popular hip hop tracks. Ghost fluting. For the last 20 yeah. years. Which, Ghost flowers. Which, by the way, of course. Yeah, right? Like, oh, he's such a genius. He learned the flute and became so good at it that he's just on flute tracks. Yeah. Yeah. I've thought about learning the piano just to become a piano comic. Oh, yeah. I don't even know what jokes I would <laughs> But I've legit thought about that. Like, uh, fuck, man, that'd be nice. Um, What's the most absurd thing you've ever done while drunk? I got drunk with a woman in Nugani, Michigan after a show. We're, we're pretty buzzed. We're like four or five then. We went to her house and we start making out like in the like as soon as we get in the door. Door slam, boom, making out. Real chemistry. And then you hear upstairs, Mommy. Oh my God. You were gone a really long time. <laughs> like oh fuck Roy. we're in some child neglect shit here and God. you know like what? you know what? like you like you're oh, drunk no. oh no oh no I, I, I hate this story Roy <laughs> oh my god she's like talking to the kid between oh, no. kisses and like I'll be right up I'm gonna check on you I said I'd come home and check on you. I'm home, right? And I'm like, oh, fuck. Wow. You're really living wrong, ma'am. And like, when you're drunk, you get like, I believe anytime you're drunk, I believe this, and granted, I've only done alcohol and shrooms, but I believe most times when you're drunk, you get these 30 second sobriety windows. Mm -hmm. Like the eye of the storm Mm -hmm. passes over Mm -hmm. your brain. And mine hit right in that moment. And I, and I go, she goes, you want to fuck? I'm like, yeah, go check on your kid and we're going to fuck. Oh, my God. I left my condoms in the car. I'll be right back. And she said, okay, go get the condoms. And I fucking ran. I fucking ran. You want to talk about running from some shit I was scared of? Fucking that. Ran. Nagani, Michigan. It was five degrees. And I fucking took off up the street to call it this is pre uber <laughs> so i'm just i'm just a black guy in the upper peninsula of michigan we're like 4 hours 3 hours north of green bay closer literally closer to canada yeah. than the rest of america and i'm a black guy in a fucking nice neighborhood yeah at 1 in the morning drunk running up the street away from a woman who has left her child at home while she bar hops with a comedian. Oh, man. And that's got to be in the show. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> my right. mom, my you... mom's going to... No, because my mom's friends will watch it. They're not going to watch this podcast. My mom's friends won't watch this. No, I get it, but... But they'll see this the show. This is it. This is the, this, this is the good stuff. What lesson is there in that? Other there... than... Start back dating black women. What what lesson? 
Because no black woman would have left her kid at home. <laughs> I think you could tie. I think you could tie it into the loneliness stuff you were talking. It's the last about time earlier. I strayed from my race. But I still think you can get it in on the show. I also think you could just you could build it. You could go into it by saying I'm uncomfortable talking about this. You know the problem with me and sex material too. Yeah. I don't think the audience buys it. They don't buy that I'd be fucking. I think that that's an issue whenever you talk about sex is that like I've never breached it ever when in my persona what if anything about me even says like I know the persona is that I'd excuse me madam would you partake in intercourse perhaps maybe after we get to the, you can talk about sex if you're not getting any right if you're in a drought you can joke about being in a drought but like I've never 26 years of this shit, I've probably have three sex jokes total that I've ever even attempted. And the only one that worked was a dick pic joke. And I didn't like that one because it just, it was too self deprecating. Like it just, it didn't fit in anything. It was self deprecating. And I just, I just didn't. So I just generally don't do sex material. So but even me that, telling a story about yeah. a horny, neglectful mother. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I don't know how to get into that or where to put, like, it might have to just be a whole sex show. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Whole... Could be. Well, you have the sex party at the front that we were talking about. But then also, I just think it's it's worth talking about that that it's an uncomfortable topic and that people will notice that. Yeah. If you point out, that if you hang a lantern on it, that is uncomfortable. It's a type of racism <laughs> that is subtextual to culture which you talk about in the imperfect messenger special you can talk about sex as a black comic if you're hot yeah like who bill bellamy talks but bill bellamy right. but bill bellamy's romantic let me take that back yeah bill bellamy is not just like i be fucking these ho bill bellamy is sensual his comedy right. talks about, and I got the roses, and I laid it out. Yeah. And ladies, you know how y'all come in there with the lingerie, and I be looking at the lingerie, and she right. was looking at her. Like, you could believe Bill Bellamy be fucking and getting lingerie. He's married now, let's be respectful. But Eddie Murphy would just talk about casual sex right. in his set, and I don't think it was ever thought. He was a big sex symbol. Yeah, yeah. you know, one way or the other. Yeah, Patrice O'Neill, in a way, there is something handsome about Patrice in the sense of the boldness in which he talked about sex and mm -hmm. getting sex, where you never question whether or not he's into some stuff. But also Patrice talking about sex was also on the extreme side. You know, he's ang anal and, you know, you have to be finger fucking a girl and then blah, blah, blah. It's just like, oh, OK, I'm with you on this journey. Right, right. Whereas I'm talking about self-checkout. Right. No, I get it. I get it. You're talking about, you're yeah, talking about yeah, mundane topics. Fucking, yeah. It's and like, then you're like. I mean, I'm talking about gun control. I'm talking about mass shootings. Yeah. And then I'm going to go to sex. I just think it's a, it's a very difficult. I have found it within my act to be a very difficult thing to merge into traffic. I get, Matt, look, I get what you're saying. I hear you. You're experiencing it with the audience and I'm not there. But I'm telling you, when I watch you live and I'm in the audience, I feel like you could go anywhere. You're okay. one of the few comics who I know who could go anywhere. You can go into politics, you can go into personal stuff, you can go into sex stuff, you can go into stuff about your dad. That's just what I think. I've been doing a thing that's been working about how, like, I spend a lot of time with, like, dads. My friends, my daughter's friends, dads, and I just go like, these dads, I go, don't tell them, but they're losers, you know? And it's like, <laughs> the subtext, of course, is I am as well. Expand. But yeah, 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 exactly. And what's funny is, is I, it's one of those bits where the audience laughs just at their losers, and it's like not even a joke. So it's like one of those things where you, like, you know you're hitting a nerve. You know there's something going on. So I just did a free write on this, I go, Dads are a troubled bunch. They're nervous. They've recently developed a stutter. They look like they just come back from a war. Most of them have not been to a war. They're afraid to speak or say anything that would contradict anyone else in the family. Uh, and then I go, 
this is a ma and I haven't done this on stage yet, but I go, this is a massive shift in my lifetime. When I was a kid, my dad was like the owner of a restaurant that was my family. He showed up when he wanted, he disappeared for weeks. <laughs> he was much nicer to the customers than he was to the staff. Employees, yeah. Yeah. That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> but if you have yeah. anything on that, because I'm just trying to. It's like, and the other thing I had is like, my dad growing up was like the dad in succession without all the money. <laughs> is there maybe there's something to explore with how you met all of these dads yeah you know, like for me most of my interactions with fathers is within the parenting groups yeah dropping off to ballet dropping School, off to musical assembly camp. thing yeah. or whatever School. correct yeah. or swim class and you meet that's what it is you meet other people dads outside of your dad's circle yeah because it's like there's like two maybe there's some three groups or whatever yeah because yeah. then it's like well what are the types of dads because like it's no different than having like they say a work wife or whatever yep. like i feel like the dads the dads within the school nucleus are probably the closest the dads you'll be closest to or yep. I don't know, almost like brothers in a way mm -hmm. you know then there's the dads that are like you know the sports and the extracurricular dads right like that's a that's a different subset as right well. in other words breaking apart the dads from a monolith of just being losers to like here's yeah. the different types of dads i interact correct with. and yeah. then deciding what is the losing thing about each of those dads <laughs> yeah yeah you know i don't know if this is true for you but maybe it's something you can put in there but i do think the thing i find interesting now and maybe i'm just wrong and maybe social media and texting has done this but I'm way more in communication with my sons, with the other parents. Yeah. Just on some PTA, PTA group texts. It's, it's endless. There's way more communication now than what I remember my mother having with other classmates' moms. Oh, yeah. And it was literally just, hey, my son is coming over there. Did he say it was okay for him to come? Okay. All right, you can go over Miss Parham's house. Yeah, yeah. Like it was that type of stuff. So maybe are the dads losers or are you just learning too much about them now? Oh, that's nice. Maybe we know too much. Yeah. You know, but then also why are you a loser? Yeah, yeah, no, certainly. I think that's what yeah. it has to get to. And it's like, why? It's like, I got to go deep on what is, how does that joke turn on itself? Yeah, my stuff, God bless you, because you have so much more fleshed out my stuff is just literally just random run-on sentences um like a lot of it starts with random thoughts yeah and then i just don't know you know where to go with it um crack is the only drug i've never been offered casually <laughs> uh, that's how i know it's good uh, <laughs> that's funny I've just, I, and that's serious, like I've never been offered, I've been offered every drug, but like crack is not a communal, <laughs> as far as I can tell, it's not a drug that people all get together. Hey man, we're doing crack out back. Yeah. Like, no, you aren't. <laughs> like, that's yeah. Just it's a solo, it's, it seems like a solo drug. Then there's, um, America must really be broke. It's, is any other country space program selling t-shirts? <laughs> That's good. Like, I don't feel confident about NASA. Like, they sell merch. Yeah, like, yeah. That's not, yeah. merch is a sign of someone who really needs $20. That's very funny. <laughs> like, but it's just such a, like, it, that could easily be a tweet if I wanted it to be. I, I'm gonna really continue to, hold your feet to the fire about doing a solo show and to Chris Rock's point about your dad. Cause that stuff I love. And I think that all the stuff, you know, you with the single mom in the Midwest, et cetera. Like I think all that stuff ties in Yeah, That's just my thought. And I, I want to see it and I'm a fan and I, I and I maybe, and you know, I want to be a part of it. So damn, just as a friend was hot too. I almost stayed bro. The fact that you didn't stay actually kind of breaks oh, my heart. Stayed. No, you can't. You can't have some seven-year-old <sighs> seeing that. No, no, I know. But all, 
All right. That kid would grow up and be a comic, and his first bit would be about seeing his mom oh my God. fucking some black guy. If I fuck that woman, that kid's for sure a comedian. Let me cut you off there. Uh, <laughs> The final thing we do on the show is called Working an Effort Cause. Is there a nonprofit that you like to contribute to? Mommy, you were gone a long oh time. Oh, my God. <laughs> Mommy, you were gone a long time. I, 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 can't, <laughs> I can't take it. You got to put that in the next uh, hour. I'm telling you, you got to put that. It, don't you think that it takes your friends in comedy to tell you which bits they have to do? Yeah. It and that, that's me telling you, you have to do that. You have to do that story. <laughs> All right. We're going to offer a cause. What's a nonprofit you like? And we'll contribute to them and link to them in the show notes. I see me, Inc. org. I see me incorporated.org. They're a wonderful nonprofit in Birmingham committed to cutting off the school to prison pipeline by promoting literacy amongst young people. Give us books involving authors and characters that look like the kids they're giving them to. Uh, run by a former school, elementary school teacher, so she knows what she's doing, and there's a connection. Basically, the quicker kids know how to read, the less likely they are to end up in prison. So it cuts off the school to prison pipeline. And so they're a dope organization. I know a lot of the people involved. I've done stuff for them before when I'm back home in Birmingham. So Well, we're going to contribute to them. It's And if people want to do the same, it's icmeinc.org. We're going to link to them as, in the show notes as well. Roy, yeah. you're the best. There's, I, I, I mean, I, there's very few people. There's you, <laughs> Mulaney, Chris Rock. I mean, I don't know how, how many people I could say that to sitting in that chair where I go, I don't know if you're the best. I don't believe in that. But I think you're in a class of your own. Well, thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. And I appreciate and you I'll, being here. I'll tell the Nagani, Michigan story soon enough. <laughs> All right.